Amen. We come today to the final topic in our series on worship, and that has to do with instruments in worship. This uh, series, or this topic, will be divided into two sermons today and next Lord's Day. Now, some may be tempted uh, to say at this point, there they go again. Now they're questioning the use of instruments in church. What's the big deal as to whether a church uses an organ or a piano in its worship? What's really at stake here? Well, very good question. What's at stake is the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not in any way trying to be uh, melodramatic. I'm not exaggerating for the sake of emphasis when I say that what is at stake is the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. The finished work of Christ at best is blurred. And at worst, the finished work of Christ is blotted out by the use of instruments in the New Covenant. For to resurrect the use of instruments from the Old Covenant, the covenant of shadows and types and ceremonies, is in principle to resurrect the temple, the priesthood, the sacrificial system better than any dispensationalist could do. The Prince of the Reformers, John Calvin, is absolutely clear on this point. He says, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ has appeared and by his advent has abolished these legal shadows. Instrumental music, we therefore maintain, was only tolerated on account of the times and the people because they were as boys as the sacred scripture speaketh whose condition required these puerile or childish rudiments. Notice what he says now. But in gospel times, we must not have recourse to these unless we wish to destroy the evangelical or gospel perfection. You want to destroy the evangelical or gospel perfection, Calvin says, introduce instruments back into the new covenant worship. Again, note how Calvin likens the use of instruments in worship with introducing all the other shadows of the ceremonial law into worship when he says, But when they, that is believers, frequent their sacred assemblies, musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense. The lighting up of lamps and the restoration of the other shadows of the law. <clears throat> Does the use of instruments in the worship of God really institute the ceremonial law anew and thereby blur the finished work of Christ and corrupt the worship of God? Are we making more out of the case than is the case? I'm convinced we are not making more of the case than is the case. That is exactly what is at stake here. Dear ones, as we gaze over the ecclesiastical landscape of churches today, we look at one end of the horizon, and there we see the Romish church. We see there the Orthodox churches. Eastern Orthodox churches, and all other churches with their high church liturgy. And then we cast our gaze to the other end of the horizon, and there we see Pentecostal and charismatic churches, evangelical churches, and even many Reformed and Presbyterian churches who have their dramas, their dancing, and their bands. Now, these two groups, Rome and their affiliates, 
and the Pentecostal evangelicals and their affiliates may seem to be at completely opposite extremes of one another. They may seem to have nothing in common, but they are really closer than you might think. In both cases, they have brought into their worship that which was part of the Old Covenant. Just as Rome will find biblical support for their priesthood, their altar, their images, and their sacrificial mass in the Old Covenant, so charismatics and evangelicals will go to the Old Covenant to find biblical support for their dramas, their drums, their cymbals, their tambourines, their horns, their guitars, and their sacred dancing. The problem any church faces, whether that church is reformed or non-reformed, when it uses simply uh, a, a, that stately organ in the church, that church places itself squarely in between those two extremes that I've just mentioned. But nevertheless, that church that only uses the organ or the piano in its worship service places itself on the same continuum or same line as those two extremes. It's interesting how Reformed churches and Presbyterian churches will go to Psalm 149 or Psalm 150 to defend their use of an organ, but will condemn in the same breath the use of drums and cymbals and tambourines, guitars, or dancing in worship. For Psalm 149 and Psalm 150 include all these various instruments and even dance in the praise of God. The only place to be, dear ones, in order to biblically critique Rome or modern evangelicalism is not to be on that same line at all, but to be on a different continuum, that of the regulative principle of worship which says that only what God clearly prescribes for New Covenant worship is to be used in the church today. <clears throat> Dear ones, if it can be demonstrated from the scriptures that the use of instruments in the worship of God was as much a part of the ceremonial law as the temple, the priesthood, and the sacrificial system, then Professor John Gerardo was absolutely right. The use of instruments in worship is, quote, heresy in the sphere of worship. And Robert L. Dabney was also accurate when he said, Christ and his apostles ordained the musical worship of the new dispensation without any sort of musical instrument. Hence, such instruments are excluded from Christian worship. Such has been the creed of all churches and in all ages except for the popish communion after it had reached the nadir, that is the lowest part, the lowest point of its corruption at the end of the 13th century. <clears throat> We'd like to answer two questions today. First of all, was instrumental music a commanded circumstance in worship? And second, was instrumental music an integral ingredient of the Old Covenant ceremonial worship? Those two questions. Was it a commanded circumstance and was it an integral part or aspect of Old Covenant ceremonial worship. <clears throat> well, first, was instrumental music in the tabernacle and the temple a commanded in a circumstance? That is, was it an ordained means of worshiping God in the Old Covenant? <clears throat> There are many of our brethren 
many whom I consider to be very dear brethren who would understand the use of instruments to be simply an aid or an help in the singing of praises to God. To the contrary, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, has noted that with regard to this point uh, as to uh, our instruments simply an aid or a help in worship, Spurgeon has said, we should like to see all the pipes of the organs in our nonconformist places of worship either ripped open or compactly filled with concrete. One broken note, one broken note, he says, from a grateful heart must have more real acceptable praise in it than all the wind which sweeps through whistling pipes. You can understand why he was the prince of preachers, even from a small quote like that. <clears throat> the point that many brethren make, dear ones, is that if instrumental music is only a help, if it's only an aid to keep people in tune or to assist God's people in praising God, it falls under the discretionary power of the church to order. If it's only an aid, then we can choose to use the aid or not choose to use it. If it's only a help, we can choose to use it or not choose to use it. Now these brethren would note that the church has no power to change that which is considered to be an element, an essential part of the worship service. But it, they would recognize, they would say that the church does have the discretionary power to alter or change that which is circumstantial, that which is a means to worship God. And so they would say with regard to Instruments instruments are not an element of worship. They're a circumstance. Therefore, we can use them. <clears throat> just to elaborate just very briefly <clears throat> on this issue of um, that which is an element as opposed to that which is a circumstance of worship, the Westminster Confession of Faith identifies that which is an element or an ordinary part of worship as things such as these, the reading of scripture, the preaching of God's word, prayer, singing of psalms with grace in the heart, and the administration of the sacraments. Those are elements of worship. Those are ordinary parts of worship. Whereas circumstances, on the other hand, are really a term that uh, denote the means or the mode by which the church performs those elements. <clears throat> For example, which specific version of the Bible the minister reads from is not an element of worship, but a circumstance. He must read the scripture, but which version is a circumstance of worship? The Bible does not, does not uh, declare, thou shalt use this particular version of the Bible when reading in public worship? Or <clears throat> how many points are in the pastor's sermon? That's a circumstance, but he must preach. That's an element. He must preach God's word. Or whether we stand or whether we sit while we're singing the Psalms, we must sing the Psalms with grace in the heart. But whether we're sitting or standing, that's a circumstance with regard to worship. <clears throat> However, can it be said that the use of instruments in worship is a discretionary circumstance like those I've just mentioned? I'm convinced that the scripture will not allow us to throw it into the category of simply discretionary circumstances over which elders or sessions or consistories have authority to use or not to use. <clears throat> the use of instruments as we seek to answer this question, are they 
Are they uh, discretionary or were they com commanded? The use of instruments in is not a discretionary circumstance. That is simply a matter of choice left up to the elders of the church to decide. Instruments in worship were never a matter of mere discretion in the Old Testament. As you look at the Old Testament, neither Moses nor David could have introduced the use of instruments into worship without the express institution of God. Does this sound, what I'm about to read, does this sound like Moses introduced the two silver trumpets into worship because he thought it would be a good idea or an aid to worship? <clears throat> Make two silver trumpets, God says, for yourself. In your appointed feasts and at the beginning of your month, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, could Moses have added uh, a third trumpet had he chosen to? Well, if it's discretionary, why couldn't he? Why was he limited to two? Could Moses have aided or helped this aspect of worship by adding drums to the two trumpets as the sacrifices were offered? Of course not. The mere asking of the question seems absurd. Of course not. It was commanded. It was not discretionary. And the same is true of David in his adding various instruments into the worship of God, which he did add more instruments than the two silver trumpets that Moses was told to add to worship. David brought in other instruments, but did he do so in order to aid the worship? No, he did so because God had commanded it. Listen to the words that we find in 2 Chronicles 29-25. Then he, that is, King Hezekiah, stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with stringed instruments, and with harps according to the commandment of David, of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. Now note, for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. No discretionary power. In fact, every institution that David brought into the worship of God, it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, was done so by the Spirit of God. And we even find in 1 Chronicles 28, 19, these words, after David has enumerated all that God told him to institute. David says this, all this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plans. Not some of the works, all of them by the hand of the Lord. <clears throat> well then, were instruments added to God's worship because Moses, David, Hezekiah, or anyone else thought that they would be an aid to worshiping God? May it never be, dear ones. They were added at God's command. And let me remind you of the seriousness of this matter. This is not something trivial at all. Apparently, David, you'll remember, when he first brought up the Ark of the Covenant, the first uh, attempt was a fiasco, a debacle. Uh, it actually, actually issued in the death of Uzzah. As we read in that particular portion of Scripture, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and then we compare that with 1 Chronicles chapter 15, we see that what is really at stake, why was Uzzah slain? It's because David did not follow the prescribed manner, not only with regard to carrying the ark, the Levites were to carry the ark upon the shoulder. That wasn't the only problem. 
But as you read closely 1 Chronicles 13, it speaks not of the Levites playing the instruments. It says all Israel played the instruments. All Israel sang. And, but in 1 Chronicles 15, David gets it right. He goes to God and God shows him. Not only must the Levites carry the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulder, but also in addition to that, the Levites are to sing and to play the instruments. This matter, dear ones, has serious consequences to it. <clears throat> Furthermore, I would ask, what authority or what discretion do we have to deviate from the specific instruments commanded by God to be used in temple worship? Once God has instituted a circumstance or an element of worship, only God can alter or change it. Now, I would submit that if instruments are for worship today, the Pentecostals and the Charismatics are more consistent with their cymbals, tambourines, guitars, and drums than the Presbyterian and Reformed churches with their mere organ or piano. I would say they're much more consistent with the biblical revelation. The use of instruments in worship was a commanded circumstance in worship, not a discretionary circumstance. Now we move on to the second question. The second question. Was the use of instrumental music an integral ingredient of Old Testament ceremonial worship? <coughs> well, hundreds of pages have been written on this subject, as in Jerado's instrumental music in the public worship of God, and as in James Glasgow's uh, work, Heart and Voice. And so my brief summary will only uh, hit the highlights. <clears throat> Was instrumental music an integral part of the ceremonial worship of the Old Covenant? Well, let's consider under Moses, first of all, very briefly. <clears throat> under Moses... Under Moses, who was commanded to blow the two silver trumpets in the context of the worship service? In Numbers 10, verse 8, The sons of Aaron the priests shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. The sons of Aaron the priests. The ministers of the Old Covenant were alone ordained to blow these trumpets. Not the prophets, not the judges, not the elders, but only the priests in corporate worship. Was the priesthood, I ask, was the priesthood part of the typical ceremonial worship? Absolutely. Absolutely. Under Moses, then, another question. When were the Levitical priests to blow the two silver, silver trumpets in the context of worship? Look at Numbers 10.10. 10. <clears throat> there we find that they were to blow the silver trumpets at the appointed feasts and new moons. They were to blow the trumpets over the burnt offerings and over the sacrifice of the peace offerings. <coughs> And so I ask, were the appointed feasts and new moons, burnt offerings and peace offerings, part of the typical ceremonial worship? Absolutely, they were. <clears throat> and a third question dealing with Moses. Under Moses, where were the Levitical priests to blow the two silver trumpets in the context of the worship service? Well, presumably... If this was done by the priests, and it was done over the sacrifices, this blowing of the trumpet would occur at the tabernacle. Was the tabernacle part of the typical ceremonial law and worship? Yes, it was. <clears throat> well, I hear one objection, and it comes from Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, where we find Miriam. At the parting of the Red Sea and the crossing of the Red Sea, Miriam takes the women 
And there we find that the women, I'll read uh, verse 20, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. <coughs> The objection is raised that uh, here we find a case in which instruments are used in worship. <clears throat> Ought this not to guide us as well in our use of instruments? Well, there's, as we look at this particular passage, I would say this passage proves too much, if that's what it's seeking to prove. Because it says only women played the instruments here. Only the women did so. Furthermore, so we could say, if anything, this is a women's meeting. Because it says that uh, all the women went after her. They followed Miriam with timbrels and with dances. Furthermore, uh, we are not only going to find support, if this is the case, for, for using timbrels in a worship service, but dances as well. And uh, all of our Reformed uh, churches and Presbyterian churches ought to pay heed then if this is a passage that they will appeal to. I would uh, offer or submit to you that this was, in fact, not a case of a corporate worship service, but more of a civil celebration of a nation that was committed to God. <clears throat> and so I don't think that this qualifies as a clear objection to the rule that we find that it was the priests that were to use the instruments in the worship of God. Now, moving on from Moses, what about David? We know that under David, many changes followed. Uh, David brought in uh, many more uh, priests and uh, Levites to assist the priests in worship. We find all kinds of responsibilities that were introduced by David for the Levites. And one of these has to do with worship, with instruments. And so we ask the question again. Under David, who was commanded to play the instruments used in the context of worship? Was it open to anybody? <coughs> or was it something that was again delegated and given only to the priests and the Levites. Well, we know, as I've already indicated, that after the catastrophe that surrounded the death of Uzzah, David at that point appointed priests and Levites alone to play the instruments in worship. And uh, again, you can look at First Chronicles chapter 15 <clears throat> and read that chapter closely, and I think you will come to that conclusion as well. But then we move on from David to Second Chronicles chapter 7 and Solomon. And again, <clears throat> Second Chronicles 7, verse 6, and this is at the dedication of the temple. And we find these words. And the priests attended to their services, the Levites also with instruments of the music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, For his mercy endures forever, whenever David offered praise by their ministry. The priests sounded trumpets opposite them, while all Israel stood. The Levites apparently sounded certain of the instruments. The priests on the opposite side sounded the trumpets, corresponding to the two silver trumpets that the priests alone were to, to play under Moses. We move from Solomon to Hezekiah <coughs> in chapter 29 of Second Chronicles. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, and his reforms that he brought, the revival he brought when true religion had sunk to such a low, and his reviving uh, the religion of that time 
he institutes the true worship of God. And in, inst in instituting the true worship of God, notice what he does in chapter 29, verse 25. Then he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with stringed instruments, and with harps, according to the commandment of David, of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet, for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. The Levites with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets still that Moses had commanded. <clears throat> Moving on in Ezra 3.10. Ezra 3.10, under Zerubbabel. This is at the worship when the foundation of the temple was finally laid. After the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians having been taken into exile, the people of God returned and they established and, and laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10 says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Now finally, <clears throat> uh, under this point, Nehemiah chapter 12 <clears throat> Nehemiah at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27. Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and singing, with cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. And then in verse 35, Notice again that it's the priest's sons who have the trumpets. And then in verse 36, it says that these musical instruments were of David, the man of God. And so we see under David, the Levites were appointed to assist the priests in the ministry of Old Covenant worship. They too, the Levites as well as the priests, were part of the typical ceremonial law and worship. <clears throat> One objection has been raised concerning the school of the prophets uh, that uh, we find a passage in 1 Samuel where Saul is told by Samuel that he will meet some prophets who are carrying instruments. Now, many have tried to conclude from simply that reference that <clears throat> other than the, the priests could use instruments in corporate worship. Now, we're not told in that situation when they played them, how they played them, or anything like that. All we know is they were carrying instruments. Now, that is not a clear warrant, if we're looking for a clear warrant upon which to, to worship God, we don't go to that kind of a passage when all that we've seen thus far clearly delineates the responsibility of the priests and the Levites to play instruments in corporate worship. The second question about David is, under David, when and where were the Levites to play their instruments in the context of the worship service? <clears throat> well, they were to play them at holy convocations associated with the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle of David, the Temple, the laying of the foundation of the Temple, the rebuilding of the Wall of Jerusalem, and the sacrificial system. All of these things I've just mentioned are associated with the typical elements and aspects of the Old Covenant ceremonial system. 
Particularly important, I think, is Second Chronicles chapter 29. If you'll turn with me back there just uh, for a brief moment. Second Chronicles 29, where we find <clears throat> the case of Hezekiah. <clears throat> I've just read verses 25 through 26, so I'll just begin with uh, verse 27. Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offering on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began. With the trumpets and with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the congregation worshipped. The singers sang and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering the king and all who were present with him, bowed and worshipped. When they were finished offering, the king and all who were present with him bowed and worshipped. Now what I want to point out just very briefly is that it appears from this particular text that the instruments were specifically played during the sacrifice of burnt offering. The instruments began playing, it says in verse 27, when the burnt offering began. And the instruments continued being played, it says, all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So during the time in which the burnt offering was brought before God, the instruments were used. Now I believe this fully coincides with what we've already seen in Numbers chapter 10, that the priests were to blow the trumpets over the sacrifice. So it appears again from these texts, and that Hezekiah, uh, the text in uh, 2 Chronicles 29 concerning Hezekiah is the most clear, specific passage with regard to when the instruments were specifically used. And yet it does coincide with what we find in Numbers chapter 10, associated with the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Thus we see, dear ones, the most intimate connection between the appointed use of instruments and the Levitical priesthood, between the instruments and the temple and the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Another objection. Well, could we not say the same thing about the singing of psalms? Since the psalms of David were sung by the Levites, they too were typical. Indeed, we could say that the psalms were typical if we were not clearly authorized to sing psalms in the New Covenant. We could say they were typical, but we are clearly authorized to sing psalms unto God in the New Covenant. But when we search for passages and scriptures in the New Covenant with regard to the use of instruments in the worship of God, the only place that we find any clear reference is in a very symbolic book, which we'll look at next week, the book of Revelation. There we find instruments used in that particular setting, but not in any earthly setting of worship in the New Covenant. None. Complete silence in the New Covenant concerning the use of instruments in worship. <clears throat> this is very interesting in light of, of their continual mention, the mention continuously of instruments in the Old Covenant with regard to the worship of God. And then complete silence in the New Covenant with regard to instruments in the worship of God. How do we explain total silence in that regard in the New Covenant? Well, <clears throat> we explain it very clearly that they were associated with the sacrificial system, with the temple, with the priesthood, and they passed away. You see, dear ones, in the New Covenant, you are not to use instruments with your singing, we find in the New Covenant, rather, you are to sing and make melody, not with instruments, but with your heart to the Lord. 
Ephesians 5.19. And we also find you are, quote, to continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of your lips, giving thanks to his name. Not instruments. The fruit of your lips is what you are to offer to God. No longer instruments. The use of instruments with psalms in the Old Covenant is like the use, pay careful attention to this analogy, the use of instruments with psalms in the Old Covenant is like the use of incense with prayer in the Old Covenant. Instruments and incense were ceremonial circumstances of the Old Covenant and they passed away. But the singing of psalms and prayer are both Old and New Covenant elements of worship and they continue. <clears throat> Dear ones, <clears throat> Paul argues vociferously that the ceremonial law was a tutor to us in our childish state to lead us to Christ. But after Christ has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In Galatians chapter 3. Paul calls the appointed feast of the Old Covenant a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. In Colossians chapter 2. The writer of Hebrews reminds his readers that the Levitical priesthood has changed in Hebrews chapter 7. A better priesthood has come, that of Christ, priesthood of Melchizedek. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that the tabernacle and temple are a copy and shadow of the heavenly things in Hebrews 8. And that the sacrifices of the old covenant were shadows of the good things to come in Hebrews 10. And that we no longer worship at an earthly Jerusalem, but at Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, in Hebrews 12. And finally, in Hebrews 13, the writer of the book of Hebrews says that we no longer offer praise to God with instruments, but rather with the fruit of our lips. Dear ones, one will search in vain to find in the New Covenant God clearly abrogating the labor where the priests washed their hands and their feet as they entered the tabernacle. You won't find any references in the New Testament that specifically say God has done away with the labor. You'll look in vain to find where in the New Covenant it says that God has abrogated incense that was offered to him by the priests or that God has abrogated the garments that were worn by the priests even the miter that sets upon the priest's head or that God clearly abrogated the candlesticks or the showbread and yet all of these were ordained circumstances of old covenant worship and have already been realized in Christ and in the new covenant all these ordained circumstances of Old Covenant worship were no more nor no less an integral aspect of ceremonial worship than the use of instruments by the Levitical priesthood in the temple. Thus, dear ones, in conclusion, to introduce instruments into New Covenant worship is not only to Judaize our worship, but it is to take one step closer to the worship of Rome. For Rome reinstituted the use of instruments in the worship of the church after some 1,200 years in which the church had not used instruments in her corporate worship. 1,200 years later, Rome instituted the use of instruments. I'm quoting from a little article by Reverend John McDonald. He says, Let our reader enter a Romish chapel. A basin of water stands at the entrance. At the further end of the chapel is an altar. Behind that altar a crucifix, and beside the altar a priest. 
Suppose we take an intelligent Romanist by the hand and ask him a few questions. Friend, why this basin at the door? Good reason for this. Have you forgotten the laver at the tabernacle door? But why that altar and the official in priestly robes? Good reason for this too. Our mass is a sacrifice and we need an altar and a priest as they had in the temple. But why that statuary there and that painting of Jesus? Why indeed, have you forgotten the statuary in the holy place and all the devotional helps that Solomon had carved within his magnificent temple? And not to go farther, if our readers wish to hear music, not the product of a puny organ or an ordinary harmonium, let them go to a Romish cathedral or to Rome itself. All these things popery has. They are part of her strength, her glory, and if we are like her to borrow this one element from Judaism, there is no reason why we may not borrow all. Then farewell to the grand simplicity of our gospel worship. God help us, beloved, to take a stand against all incipient Judaism of the Old Covenant and against all movement toward Rome. Dear ones, the purity of the gospel message depends upon the purity of gospel worship. If we lose the purity of gospel worship, we have lost the gospel. Do you see how intimately the gospel is connected to our worship? And we cannot take that first step. God help us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we praise you. It is our desire to worship you as you have commanded and not because we want aids and helps to worship. Lord, we present to you what you have commanded unto us and what you desire most is not sacrifice but obedience. What you desire most is not an outward ritual but an inward expression of love and devotion. Oh Father, we pray that you would cause our hearts to rise in thanksgiving and praise for Jesus Christ. For we see afresh and anew that because all the ceremonial law has been ended, has been abrogated, that Jesus' work is finished. And just as the instruments were played during the offering of the sacrifice in the Old Testament, so we see that they ended at the completion of that sacrifice. We likewise know that instruments ended when the sacrifice of Christ was finished because they pointed to Christ in the New Covenant. And so another another way in which we know that our sins are forgiven. Another way that we know that the work of Christ is complete is by the fact that we are no longer using instruments in our worship. And this fact should cause great joy, O oh Father, to well up in our hearts today. And we pray, Lord God, that you would give us grace to see clearly these matters. For Jesus' sake, Amen. <clears throat> Dear ones, as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table today, <clears throat> I, I hope that theme came through loud and clear to you today. <clears throat>
that the work of Christ is finished and complete. I hope you see that you need never doubt that your assurance is based upon a certainty, a fact, that, a, that redemption has been accomplished in Christ. We cannot add to the sacrifice of Christ one speck. To add anything on our part would be to pollute and corrupt that perfect sacrifice. And how do we know that that's the case? Because we don't play instruments. Not only because we don't have uh, sacrifices, not only because we don't worship in a temple anymore, not only because we don't have a priesthood, but because we don't have instruments anymore. So we need to rejoice in these truths because it's another assurance that God has fulfilled His Word that we are redeemed. We belong to Him. And so reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> we find these words. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. <coughs> But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him, <coughs> excuse me, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. <coughs> this meal <coughs> that we partake of today speaks of the finished work of Jesus Christ as well. It reminds us <clears throat> as we look back and reflect this is, this is the sacrifice, this is the <coughs> death that all of those sacrifices of the Old Testament were pointing to. All of that ceremonial uh, worship was pointing to, it was a big drama that was pointing to that one event. And now we live on this side of the sacrifice of Christ. And we look back in thanksgiving that it's been fulfilled. And we are alive. That we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to Him. And we are to glorify Him in these weak vessels, these bodies, and in this spirit. Whatever we do or say, we are to do to His glory. And so that should have a dynamic <coughs> effect upon our speech. The way we speak. That our tongues should not be cursing and, and using vulgar language, but should be rather using kind, considerate, gracious language toward one another. This should uh, affect our attitude, the fact that our redemption is secure, it's accomplished, and it's been applied to us by the Spirit of God should affect the way we think. That we should deal with lustful thoughts, angry thoughts, envious gre uh, thoughts, greed, bitterness, we're not going to live lives of perfection 
this side of heaven. But by God's grace, dear ones, we need not be enslaved to any sin <clears throat> because Jesus has died and been raised from the dead. And so today, let's reflect upon these wonderful truths <clears throat> as we approach the table today. Let us acknowledge <clears throat> that God says to us, first of all, He speaks very clearly to us that we belong to Him. He has redeemed us and we are in fellowship with Him due to the work of Jesus Christ. And let us say in return and respond to God that we will submit ourselves anew to Him, that we will renew our vows to follow Him this day. And so I encourage you, and exhort you in the name of the Lord to, to search your own lives, <clears throat> to, of all those sins that you know, to repent and turn from them, to seek God's forgiveness, to be reconciled with your neighbor, with your husband, with your wife, with your children, and to live as much as it is possible within you at peace with all men. Let's come before God in prayer, asking His blessing upon this meal. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we ask you to sanctify these elements, to set them apart from ordinary use to uh, extraordinary use, from a natural use to a supernatural use in our life. We pray, Father, that as we believe and trust in Christ, as we partake of these elements, we affirm anew that we believe and trust in Christ as the resurrection and as our life. We pray, Father, that you would use this time to draw us unto yourself and to one another as well to see that we all partake of the one bread, though we're many members, that we have all been united together to Christ, and that we enjoy this sweet communion and fellowship, this love for one another, the desire to encourage and lift up one another, not because we're just good people or, or for any other reason than the fact that we belong to you and we are united to one another. And we are closer to one another by the Spirit than we are to any blood relation. We pray, Father, that you would enrich our covenant with one another. That our children would grow to love <clears throat> the children in this church of other families. And that this fellowship, this, this church, would be characterized <clears throat> not by contention, not by animosity, but God, that it would be characterized <clears throat> by a love for the brethren. Our God, we pray that you would uh, forgive us of all of our sins, that you would deliver us <clears throat> from all temptation, and that you would cast us anew upon our Savior and his shed blood. <laughs> Father, we pray that you would fill us with your grace now as we partake in faith, knowing that we are not perfect, but knowing that we have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and the scripture says he broke it, and I, ministering on behalf of Christ, give to you, God's people, the bread of life. 
Hebrews 9, then indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service <clears throat> and, the earth, and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared by the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, and which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of, of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Having obtained eternal redemption, dear ones. We don't talk about any kind of hypothetical salvation. <clears throat> Ours is a reality. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, Take, eat this bread. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. manner the Lord also took the cup which speaks of the new covenant which the Lord established with his people no longer was the covenant ratified with the blood of bulls and goats and animals but now ratified with the blood of the sinless son of God and so the Lord gives to you dear ones the cup of the new covenant <clears throat> 